So hello, everyone. Very big welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe. I am the host of the Expat Money Show. And today with my business partner, Michael Strong, we have formed Expat International School. I'm not going to do too much about my background. I'm going to guess if you are on today's presentation, you know who I am. You've either read my book or on my newsletter or in my Facebook group or listen to the podcast or on YouTube or any of the many, many, many crazy things that I do for content creation. So I'm going to uh let michael introduce himself a little bit more michael if you can kind of tell everybody about yourself your education your background how long you've worked in this space because i think it's all very relevant terrific thank you well great to be here with you michael great to see the participants uh joining uh, as they come in so i've been uh, in education for about 35 years and um i'll start actually before i got into education because it was distinctive i went to uh saint john's college in uh santa fe new mexico it's known as a great book school i actually left harvard to go to saint john's because harvard had famous people talking at me but i wanted to talk about ideas so um i spent four years there and then in the late 1980s i began leading socratic seminars in public schools in chicago that led to my creating a school in alaska uh, first, I trained public school teachers in Alaska. Parents loved what we were doing, and they asked me to create a private school there. So I created what became the Athenaeum School. I then uh, went to San Antonio and joined a Montessori school and developed a um, model for a high school there and socratized, so to speak, their pre-K through 8 program. I then went to um, South Florida and created a school for highly gifted children known as the Winston Academy with Winston Ling, who's actually part of a famous uh, Brazil, Brazilian family. And um, I think he now owns the Brazilian uh, Miss Universe contest or something. Okay. But um, Winston and I created that. At one point, it was probably the most academically advanced school in the US with uh, middle school students taking and passing advanced placement college level courses. I then created uh, Montessori Middle School programs for uh, the Early Learning Institute, a multi-campus organization in Palo Alto, then created a charter high school in Angel Fire, New Mexico, which was ranked the 36th best public high school in the US after three years and one of the worst performing regions of the United States. Um, along the way, I wrote and published The Habit of Thought from Socratic Seminars to Socratic Practice, um, the first of two books. Uh, after I was in Angel Fire, in Moreno Valley High School. I met John Mackey, the founder and CEO of Whole Foods Market. John and I had both um, come from the left, but become pretty libertarian. And um, as a consequence, we thought entrepreneurial solutions were the way to go. So for about the next decade, I worked with Mackey and others on entrepreneurial solutions to world problems. It was a nonprofit. Among other things, I helped to um, get a the first what's now called a startup city or charter city going in Honduras. Uh, the current version on the island of Roatan is sort of a 2.0 version of something I got going years ago. Um, after working on that for a long time, I went back into education, started what was co-school in Austin. That then led to being hired by the largest Montessori organization in the US to create their high school model. And so we had high school, brick and mortar high school in, in San Francisco, New York, Austin, and St. Louis. Our New York campus was 50K a year. Our San Francisco campus was 40K a year. When COVID came, um, everybody else was complaining about how bad virtual education was. Our school transitioned beautifully to online education, in part because dialogue is pretty effective and we were experts in dialogue and student-driven projects. And um, I took off uh, from that program to start my own virtual school a year ago, a little over a year ago, summer of 2020. Um, it's called the Socratic Experience. Then last spring, um, Mikkel, well, I had the pleasure of interviewing Mikkel for a, well, he interviewed me first. I think you I interviewed, interviewed you first. Actually, right. I think you and I started talking first. Then I had you on my program. Then you had me on your program. So exactly. Lots of back and forth. Yeah. Exactly. And we discovered we were so aligned that we wanted to create uh, the Expat International School, which is a virtual international school based on the Socratic experience, but catering to expats, explicitly focused on freedom entrepreneurship and issues of interest to expats, including Mikkel's Expat Money Show and Foreign Languages. 
and we'll get into that more, but that brings us to the present. So thank yeah, you. Michelle. Absolutely. Well, I think it is very relevant because, you know, I do not have a background in education. And if our listeners tonight have not followed me for any length of time, they might know that I actually dropped out of school when I stopped going to school when I was 12 and I dropped out when I was 15, officially dropped out. So I don't have a big background in education, but I do have a big background in learning and I have a massive passion for education. But what we've been able to do is partner a lot of our ideas together. Now, you're an entrepreneur, Michael, and I'm an entrepreneur, so we are definitely to run a school to teach entrepreneurship. So we're going to get into some of those reasons in a minute on why this school is so applicable. But before we get into that, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping so you guys understand the format today. We don't have a very um, shiny sales presentation or anything like that. This is really an open house format. We are here to answer as many questions as humanly possible. We want to get to know everybody. So please use the chat bar. You guys can put in questions. We're going to do a huge Q&A at the end. So if you if we're speaking, we're discussing something and you think of something, put it in the in the chat bar and I will try to get to everybody's question at the end. So that's the main difference today. We don't have um, a PowerPoint or anything like that. We're going to talk probably for about 15, 20 minutes about the program, about the curriculum, about some of the reasons why that this is, we feel that this is such an important uh, venture that we're partaking on here. And then we're going to open up everything to Q&A. So those are the big things. Um, from my side, I want to express why I felt like this was, was such uh, a needed thing to be done. I guess mostly because I had a terrible time through education when I was growing up. And I think that traditional state-run schools are really not the answer for education. I find that as I learn things, that mentorship works very well, um, a lot of dialogue, a lot of communication, a lot of asking questions, a lot of being allowed to fail and make mistakes. I think that um, standardized testing is a horrible thing. Um, it forces children to study and cram for one thing, but not necessarily internalize it and to understand it completely. So those are some of the big reasons from the education side. Now, from the business side, what ended up happening was I work mostly with private clients. I am a consultant for the expat and offshore space. So I help Americans and Canadians and Europeans as well. But the majority of my people are Americans and Canadians. I help them move them overseas themselves, their business, their lives, their finances, et cetera, et cetera. But what started happening over and over again was the questions would come up. Well, what about the kids? What are we going to do for education? You know, we just got into a good school district or the kids have all of their friends there. How are we going to break it to them that we're moving overseas? Now, if you are on today's presentation, I, I assume that you are either already or an expat or you have an interest to be an expat. You're an expat hopeful and you want to move overseas. So I think that these are probably concerns that maybe you've thought of before as well for your children. How are you going to do this? How are you going to have your kids educated overseas? I'm going to talk a little bit about what the options are out there and then maybe why we are a good fit. So I've been living overseas for 21 years straight. Um, I used to live in the Middle East. We had international schools everywhere. International schools is a, a viable option for a lot of people. But there are some real life problems that happen with these. Now, as expats, what can often happen is you move to a country, uh, mom gets a job, you move to a new country, or dad gets a job, you move to a new country, and the kids get put in school. And they're there for one year, two years, three years. But eventually, mom or dad gets a transfer, and they need to go to another country. So for example, maybe they're in Dubai for one or two years, and then they get transferred to Hong Kong, and then they get transferred to London, and the kids get their lives picked up and moved again. Now, it might be very nice and exciting and things like this, but we do find that kids want to have the same friends and they want to have this longevity in their relationships as friends. Now, that's definitely lacking in traditional education and traditional, um, well, not traditional education, but traditional uh, online, or sorry, uh, international schools. So the kids end up being pulled out and moved to another school. What we've done with a virtual school is allow the kids to continue to go to the same program. So it doesn't really matter which country you're in or if you switch countries, you're still going to see the same kids every day. You're going to be in the same class. You're going to have the same type of friends. So that's a, a huge boon for the kids because maybe they have a very good home life with you and they feel very good about that. 
but their social interactions with their peers can be very jarring when they move overseas. So those are some of the big reasons that I felt that education was something to get into. Now, obviously, with COVID, with all of the changes that have happened, with um, social distancing and mask, I mean, I'm not here to talk politics. I don't know what your uh, personal perspective on this is, but I know that a lot of people are very unhappy with these types of things. So going back to state-run schools or international schools might not be a good option for you if you don't agree with this. So from my side, this is a really good option. Um, it's an online program, and Michael, I'll, I'll kind of allow you to talk more about the program specifically, but those are some of the reasons from my side. Terrific. Thank you, Mikhail. That, that was really helpful background. I'm going to start with high-level principles, and then I'll dig into, uh, uh, I'll give kind of a concrete description of the middle school, um, describe briefly the high school, and then briefly the elementary program, <coughs> and then we can open it up to Q&A. So a couple of high-level principles. One is consistent with the whole um, idea of entrepreneurship. We value agency and purpose a lot. Um, conventional education, I would say, does not. John Taylor Gatto, twice named a New York State Teacher of the Year, describes traditional education as 13 years in training and how to be passive and dependent. Um, while we're not purely Montessori, I do have that Montessori background and agency is important and also entrepreneurship. And I see um, entrepreneurial projects in secondary school as a wonderful manifestation of student agency. We'll go into that more. On the academic side, um, the founder of Stanford Online High School talks about skills forward curriculum. And what he means by that, and I like it, is skills are the most important thing because if you have high level skills, you can do anything. And certainly high-level reading, writing, speaking, listening skills are always useful. With math, it varies a lot. If you want to be an engineer, especially to go into MIT or Stanford, you need very high-level skills. Uh, if you want to go into business, a finance background might be more important. So at the secondary level, we'll customize what counts as appropriate high-level skills in STEM dependent on the direction your child goes. And we do have a lot of students who are entrepreneurs or creatives where the traditional math path is not optimized. Um, within that, we focus on both students who go to college as well as students who choose not to. Um, I'm a big fan of people who want to go, as Mikkel's a living example of this, direct to the workplace. A lot of our students are entrepreneurial or creative professionals who want to take off and um, live a great life without university, but we also prepare students for a university. Um, my own experience is primarily in the US, but I do have some experience in the British system. And as we're looking at other universities around the world, we'll kind of look case by case. But if a student has very high level academic skills, they're welcomed by pretty much in any university and they can pass the tests needed, which is why that's kind of a general focus. So that's all kind of abstract. Let me walk you through a concrete week in the middle school. And then again, I'll modify for high school and elementary. Um, so we, right now, I think in central time, so I'll call it 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, central time. As we grow, we'll have East Coast time zone, Pacific time zone, and other Western hemisphere. Then eventually we'll have Asian. Right now we're primarily Western hemisphere, we do have people in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East who join, although it's late at night. We actually have a Pakistani girl who uh, ends one of her classes at two in the morning. So that, that's extreme. But right now, um, we don't have programs for you know the Far East. We'll get there. Um, so 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday through Friday Central. And the way it starts, everything is organized in cohorts of 15 to 1 or fewer. So it's high touch and interpersonal. A lot of the criticism of virtual education is that it's boring and impersonal. From the get-go, we're very high touch and personal. We start with, we call it community, and it's really a time where we let the kids hang out and interact. Um, what we've discovered is that kids need to be kids, and um, they do need to connect with other kids. And the rest of our academic day goes better when we give them time in the morning without an academic agenda and let them laugh, joke, books, movies, projects, games, current events, hang out, 
you know, just some time to connect like they would if they were getting together with their friends at a school or at lunch hour or whatever. Um, and that's the beginning of a day that's very contact rich. The next piece of the day is personal growth. There, rather than being didactic, I realized a long time ago that preaching at kids is not very effective, but we have a conversation every day about topics such as how do you set goals? How do you learn from your mistakes? What do you do with anger? What do you do if your friend betrays you? How do you manage your time? All of these kinds of things. We see becoming a, an adult human being as a complex process, and we give kids time to think and discuss this. And over time, they become much more aware and um, sophisticated about self-management, both of their internal personal life as well as external things like time management and goal setting. The next part, we take a little break. The next part is Socratic, it's my specialty. We read a complex um, text, typically short, philosophy, literature, poetry, economics, sociology, psychology, all kinds of things. And the kids read and discuss the text at hand. Um, most kids like it most of the time because kids like to argue. And so they, they get engaged that way. And at the same time, if they wanna be fully in the conversation, they need to have read the this read the text. I see your question, Daniel. I'll get that to that briefly in a minute. They need to have read the text, and that motivates kids to read things that they otherwise would not read at all. Uh, bit by bit, they develop a taste for reading and discussing ideas, and sometimes we focus on a sentence or paragraph to train them on breaking apart complex passages. Sometimes we talk big, big picture, we relate it, to their relate it to their lives. There's a whole artistry of how to get kids engaged in complex readings. Um, but over time, they become very good at it. Um, Daniel asks, how do you handle different personalities, introverts versus extroverts? Great question. I would say one of the most important things, first of all, is um, to have an environment where kids do feel welcome and safe. And sometimes, for instance, that means allowing the introverts to be quiet. Um, we don't require students to say anything. What we do do is at the end, we typically do a debrief and just check in. How was that? What worked? Best part? Worst part? Things like that. And that debrief at the end does a couple of things. One, it gets even the quiet kid's voice into the conversation, however minimally, but they are connected. The other is we find out a lot. Are they quiet because they're shy, because they're afraid, because they're angry, before, because they're bored? You know, because they're sad, you know, that gives us a lot of information. And also we could kind of see, you know, sometimes they'll give us a lot of information about what they really were excited about. They didn't say it, but next time we can ask them in particular, oh, last time you were passionate about injustice. Tell us what you think about this situation. Is it just or unjust? So we have a whole repertoire of techniques for bringing in the quiet ones with uh, and rather than introverts, extroverts, I'll talk about kind of quiet versus dominant. One of the biggest um, ways in which these conversations can go badly is if a small group of kids dominate the conversation over and over and over again, it becomes very tedious for everybody. And so, you know, the back of my book has a rubric for how to behave in these things. If the students score well on every dimension of this rubric, then they are great participants. And ultimately, we get the more talkative ones to learn to become leaders and ask questions and weave threads together in the conversation rather than shut up you idiots don't you get it already you know, i'm exaggerating a little bit but you can imagine uh something said with a tone like that um you know is a problem um so i see the other questions we'll get to the younger ages in a minute let me kind of be linear and go through the rest of the school day and the week um after socratic we do writing a fair number of kids like to write fiction. Very few kids like to write essays. Most kids hate essay writing. Um, I often say I love learning and I hate school. One of the things I really hated were language arts classes where the teacher would ask me to write on the symbols of blah, 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 and I had no idea why she was asking me to do it. it seemed like a weird game. I didn't understand the rules to. So instead of that, um, we see writing as a continuation of discussion. I'll give you an example. Last spring, we had a discussion on whether we should bring the woolly mammoths back from extinction or not. We read two articles by from Yale. One said, yes, we should because of A, B, and C. Another said, no, no, we shouldn't because of X, Y, and Z. The students argue about it. They have very strong opinions. Yes, we should, we shouldn't. We should if and only if this, whatever. And we're not here to tell them what to think. We want them to think, come up for reasons to support their thinking. And then in the essay writing, They've just written a thesis. They don't realize it, but I will believe we should not let the woolly mammoths bring the woolly mammoths back from extinction because, you know, 
the environment, you know, weird things, whatever they think. And we help them learn to outline an essay. And the real point that I tell students over and over again is it's not about writing essays for school. If you go to university, yes, you need to do that. But it's about organizing your thoughts. And every email we write as adult professionals should be well organized and clear. The goal is clear, well organized expository writing. Um, and ultimately, we have them do public writing. And by that, I mean initially something like an Amazon review. So it's one thing to uh, you know write something and have get feedback from your teacher. It's another thing to post an Amazon review where the public can provide feedback on your writing. And then right now, there are an infinite number of you know blogs, journals, you know places where they can actually get published. Um, and have the world read their writing. And for older students, that's that's actually quite empowering. So that's writing. The next piece is uh, personal projects. Number of schools do project-based learning, which is typically where the teacher organizes a project and the students learn some academic skill through the project they're doing. We do some of that. But when we talk about projects, the ultimate goal is adult level professional competence by 18 years old or better. And so it's not about um, the teacher orchestrating something, it's about what can you do that you care about and ultimately is valuable in the world. So when they're in middle school, often it's just fun, cutesy things. I've had students who had a downhill ski racer who um, learned how to wax, sharpen, repair skis. I had a student who loves to cook, learning how to cook fancy five course uh, French meals. Had a student who loves James Bond who created um, an exploding briefcase. Uh, not really explosion, but baking soda and vinegar kind of thing. So whatever it is, we get them started, taking initiative, bringing a project to its completion. But gradually, we mentor them so that the projects are bigger, more substantial in scope, more real world. Um, so I've been doing this for about 10 years. I've had a student who created the official website for an American Idol finalist. It was his celebrity website for a year, and then he fired the student, which was painful, but a good experience. I had a student do training videos for Kaiser Permanente, the California healthcare chain. I had a student write for Atlas Obscura, a million monthly page views edited by an Atlantic monthly editor. Um, had a student who did a three-day music festival here in Austin as a sophomore. He was booking bands, booking venues, making about 8,000 bucks that year. By a senior, he had an $80,000 budget, three-day music festival, bands throughout the world. And this kind of thing is uh, actually really impressive for college admissions. And so the idea is to support your child in doing something impressive from an adult perspective. And I'm a great believer that, um, yeah, all, all kids, if they're given the support and start early, can do adult level professional competence or better. Um, after projects, lunch, go outside, get some fresh air. In math and science, math has two components. One component is the linear math curriculum. So it's pretty standard, uh, algebra one, well, geometry, algebra two in high school. There are pre-algebra and so forth before that. Uh, and it's adaptive software, so it's personalized to your child. They can go at their own pace. We encourage them as a default to cover one year of math per year. But we've had students do a year and a half, two years, one case, four years of math in one year. Or if your child has backfilled, maybe they had a bad year of math earlier, we can slow it down and do half a year of math where they spend time really learning what they missed. It's much better to have a solid foundation than to rush. So whatever the math goals are, we personalize that to your child based on you know what's best for you, your child, and your goals. We also in math have math problem solving, which is group problem solving. Um, the linear curriculum is fine for you know learning the basics, but we believe in learning to solve relatively challenging and or less structured problems. Sometimes we use brilliant.org that has a bunch of kind of brain teasers and logic problems. We've used something called CSMP, which is a wonderful, wonderful curriculum um, designed to create mathematical numeracy, uh, literacy. And then we also use math competition problem sets. So um, instead of one child struggling in the math competition, there are a group of them working to solve a difficult math problem. Science also has two components. We have a quantum camp, which is a um, kit. You get a scientific kit in the mail and they do little experiments. Um, we start class, what are we gonna learn? What, how do you set that up? They do the experiment, uh, keep the zoom on, and at the end, what did you learn? What worked, what didn't? And we also have science Socratics where they discover 
you know, what is science? What is evidence? What is proof? Um, how does science work and build and that kind of thing? That's the schedule Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesdays are different to have a kind of a different pattern. Right now we have four electives for Wednesdays, but we'll add more. Um, our four current electives are art, technology, music, and philosophy, politics, and economics. In art, we start with pencil drawing and go through anime, animation, graphic novels, and YouTube channel. Technology starts with hardware 101, software 101, um, programming, and then ultimately gets to robotics, machine learning, brief introductions. Um, music is global music appreciation, some performance based on uh, percussion and voice, unless they already play an instrument, and the basics of music theory, how rhythm, harmony, and melody combine to create the amazing sounds we do, we listen to. And then finally, philosophy, politics, and economics um, is loosely based on the Oxford course by that name, adapted for much younger children, and kind of a big picture perspective on how different governments and societies and cultures around the world have organized their life. It includes a strong strand of political philosophy. Um, I'm actually teaching that course. And in general, in our Socratics, we combine classic readings with contemporary readings to give you a very concrete sense here. For tomorrow, we're reading an excerpt from Hobbes' Leviathan. And then after that, we're reading um, Franz de Waal's uh, Chimpanzee Politics. You know, Hobbes, basically, life is uh, nasty, brutish, and short. We're all selfish. And then chimpanzees, uh, they may be cute, but boy, they are not nice to each other. Um, so we kind of combine these classic texts with more contemporary texts. Um, I see your question, Scott, get to it in a minute. One other piece of our program is that every child has 20 to 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one with a mentor every week. The time with a mentor covers their projects, how to set goals, how to get to the next step, um, how to land the plane, or if they're in search of a new project, what do you do? What are your long-term goals? Um, what do you want to do post high school? What courses are you taking? How do they relate to your goals? Um, the mentorship is very high touch and it helps students kind of integrate the personal growth, their academics, their projects, their post high school plans. So they get a sense of who they are, what they're doing and why it all makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, let's talk about that. Oh, um, you don't think this math class is gonna be relevant to you know, your career as a video producer? Let's talk about that. Maybe it doesn't, whatever. Um, so that's the kind of middle school real quickly. Um, so yeah, I'll answer Scott. The variety of classes for groups of 15. So the way the teacher is subject is the Socratic hum Humanities in the morning, which includes the community, personal growth, humanities, writing. That is a one humanities teacher. The STEM guide is typically, you know, a um, math science person and a different one in the afternoon. The Wednesday electives are all taught by different people. And we are adding more Wednesday electives and each of those will be taught by different people. So basically they have uh, one guide in the morning, a different guide in the afternoon for humanities and STEM, and then different guides on Wednesdays. And the humanities and STEM guides are the ones who mentor the students. Well, and I've sat in on a lot of the classes as well, Michael. Um, maybe you can actually spend a minute and talk about some of the guides that we have, because I thought it was very inter interesting, the interaction of our guides, specifically our um, guide who is teaching programming, or our guide who is teaching art, which I think is just absolutely fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. So a couple of things on this. First, um, already we have an extremely international faculty. We've got um, a guide from Mexico, we've got a guide from Turkey, we've got an assistant from Honduras. Um, and in addition, we actually have some young people teaching the electives. So um, I, I've always, one of the things doing alternative uh, programs is how do you get great talent? And the best are people that have come up through the program. So we have an art teacher who is maybe 19 and was trained by an art teacher I taught with at a different school. And he is young, dynamic, you know, especially when you get into anime. He knows anime in a way that uh, people of another generation might not know. Our tech guide is actually a young tech entrepreneur himself. He is somewhat similar background to Mikkel. He left school early, traditional school, and was going to um, you know, hackathons by the time he was 10 and 11, starting software companies by the time he was 12 or 13, and uh, teaching tech by his late teens. And again, very dynamic, knows contemporary tech and what the kids love. I've got a STEM guide who actually went to my brick and mortar school and you know, 
when he goes through the program with the kids, he said, oh yeah, when I was a student, this is what it was like for me and you know can kind of relate. So we definitely have a combination of very experienced guides from around the world and then young people, uh, because part of it is they're inspired by young people. Kind of one other note on that, um, I brought a lot of guest speakers into the class and for entrepreneurship, we'll do a lot of that. And uh, there's a huge difference uh, between bringing a 22-year-old entrepreneur and bringing a 40-year-old entrepreneur. Absolutely. Uh, for all you parents, you know, it, maybe a lot of you are younger than 40, but you know, you're, you're like light years away, kind of a different creature from a different planet. Whereas somebody who's in their 20s, wow, their eyes open up and they get all excited. This person is really, you know, my kind of person. So that's a quick summary of the middle school. Let me go quickly to high school and then quickly to novice, which was what we call the upper elementary, and then we'll go to Q&A. High school is similar to middle school, but much more personalized and flexible. And part of that is students go in different paths. I think of our students as um, three different buckets, some creative, some entrepreneurs, some intellectuals, and obviously those are complementary. They can be two or all three of those. But you know, a lot of our creatives uh, wanna focus on their creative professional work Pretty, pretty monomaniacally in high school. And if they're gonna be a creative professional um, post high school, they may not need college prep. Or if they're gonna to go to art school or design school or film school, they may not need a lot of traditional college prep. And if they and their parents are on board with that, we're on board with that. So we don't force one size fits all. And our entrepreneurs may wanna be focused on making money. I actually had a student who was into day trading and he was uh, spending a lot of his days uh, as a day trader making money that way rather than uh, traditional academics, and we supported him in that. His parents were on board, and uh, he came out of high school knowing how to make money. Um, so whatever it is, we customize in high school a lot more. Um, you know, coding, a lot more languages. They can take languages in middle school, but even more in high school. Um, you know, they we want to support their interests. So whatever their interests are, the high school project program becomes much more specialized. The other thing is, there are an infinite number for all practical purposes of online courses that we can support the students in taking in. So for instance, Coursera has thousands of college courses. I've had students take uh, UPenn Ivy League economics course. I've had students take Harvard CS50, uh, the introduction to computer programming, computer science at Harvard. I've had a student who's taken a course in world history at University of Virginia. So in addition to whatever courses we offer on our core, one way to think about high school is they're more autonomous and uh, much more developed with respect to skills. And so we can help them uh, target uh, any of the incredible variety of courses that are available um, to complement whatever we're offering. Um, and yes, Spanish is definitely a high school course that is available also in middle school. And I'll let Mikel talk. Well, actually, maybe I'll pause. You want to talk about the foreign language? Sure. And then I'll go to the novice program. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you guys have been on my newsletter for any length of time, you probably have heard me talk about my friend Ollie Richards. He's a very dear friend of mine. He runs an online program called I Will Teach You a Language through a method called story learning. It is very much in line with Michael and my belief system on learning. It's not rote memorization. It is really based on something that is gonna be more interesting and engaging for the kids. So we are in negotiation with him right now to license his program and offer it to our kids. So we're really excited about this. I think this is an amazing opportunity. I'm a massive fan of his work. Um, I used his program to actually go from really crummy Spanish to quite fluent within about six months to a year. I am not perfect in Spanish by any means, but it was a very, very firm background and I am able to live my life completely in Spanish. I live in Panama full time. Today I'm in Colombia. You're not finding a lot of English on the street here, but I can live my life in Spanish being completely bilingual thanks to that. In addition to that, we actually have some of our guides who are native Spanish speakers. So we have Melanie who's coming on board. She's from Guatemala. She is a lovely girl. She has a background as an engineer. She'll be teaching the STEM. So we're gonna be offering some of those programs in Spanish, as well as some of the other guides that Michael mentioned from Honduras, from Mexico, from other countries. 
So as the schools grow, we're going to be able to offer additional languages. Spanish will 100% be the first language that we offer. But even if there was a language that your child was very passionate about and we were not offering, we will still be able to support. So say, for example, your child is obsessed with uh, anime and they love Japanese culture and they want to learn the Japanese language. Well, we will have things in place to be able to support these. So really, the entire program is very customizable to your child's needs and wants. We want to make this engaging and fun. We want the kids to enjoy themselves. You know, we only have so much time on planet Earth, and I don't feel like it's a good idea to waste anybody's time at any age. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or 18 years old or 50 years old. We shouldn't be wasting our time here. So as I've been attending the classes, and I've, I've sat in on every single one of the class by this point, it is so different to watch. The kids are really engaged. They're interacting. They're talking amongst themselves. They're talking with the guide. There's so many different things. It's really beautiful to see. Actually, I would say it is completely different <laughs> than what I remember school being like. And I'm, and I'm very proud to say that, actually. Very, very proud. So yes, we're going to be able to offer Spanish as well as other languages. As Michael said, other programs that maybe are not electives right now, but we'll still be able to support through alternative uh, education platforms and bring them in. Does that make sense? Terrific. Thank you, Michaela. Actually, just on the other electives, one that I'm planning on bringing in sooner rather than later is design and makerspace. Mm -hmm. And so people can buy, you know, you can get a 3D printer pretty cheaply now. And so we'll have a guide actually separate from our technology course, which is more computers, uh, getting into design makerspace kind of things. Um, so Bryce has a question. It's worth clarifying. So I created a program called the Socratic Experience a year ago. So we're in the second year of the Socratic Experience. Mikkel has recruited some of his community into our program. As we get larger and get a cohort of just expat international schools, will spin out. And so that's either January or next fall, we'll have a separate distinctive cohort that's just mm -hmm. expats. So you can um, think of the two programs as sister schools. We have a domestic school, we have an international school. At the moment, all of the kids are combined. As things grow, we will separate. Now, if one kid wants to be in a program that's not offered in one of the schools, we still are sister schools. We'll still work very closely to one another, and we'll be able to mix and match based more on the child's needs. And th thank you, Elizabeth. I'll address your question before going to the, um, you know, young one. I would say one of the things about skills focused is if we use and develop skills, you know, we don't forget how to speak English. Uh, Mikel is not going to forget about how to speak Spanish. Um, I actually haven't spoken Spanish in a long time, so my Spanish is rusty and I have kind of forgotten it, but I spend a week coming back in. So part of it is at the skill level, if they're engaged every day in reading challenging material or every day in challenge, doing challenging math problems, and that's part of the culture, I'm very big on creating a culture where learning is normal and respected, then you know it's not retained. One of my criticisms of regular school is that it's memorize and forget. I was actually great at um, getting straight A's throughout high school and I would memorize it the night before, get my A on the test and forget it and it was gone. Um, so we don't spend time on that. We're very focused on high level skills. That said, if, you, if something is meaningful, then you remember it. So I'll give you a very concrete example. I was once working with a world history teacher who had uh, spent 17 years teaching the French Revolution. It, it took her three weeks every year to teach the French Revolution. I said, look, I want to have two weeks of that for Socratic discussions on Rousseau and inequality. And then you have one week left. And she was horrified, but she also realized even in three weeks, none of the kids were paying attention or very few of them. So what happens is basically we spent two weeks arguing about inequality and the kids became very passionate about inequality. You know, walk up to your average 13 year old, they don't care about inequality. But if you argue about it, you care about it. And then when she started teaching them about the French Revolution, wow, then they remember it. It becomes meaningful. So, again, if something's meaningful, we remember it. We create a culture where learning is um, socially interesting, relevant, and meaningful. And that's how it works. Um, so, to go back to the novice program, and 
actually, before I dig in, somebody asked about children under age eight. We say ages eight uh, through 11 or so. Um, first of all, we're not rigid about grade level or age levels. Everything is so personalized. Um, if your child is suited for a different age or grade, we'll do what's right for the child. That's the first rule, what's right for this particular child. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples there. We actually have an eight-year-old boy who is an absolute intellectual rock star. So he goes from the elementary program to the middle school um, a couple hours a day because he's at middle school level academics, but he's socially more appropriate with younger children. Mm -hmm. so we actually let him get his high level academics with the older kids and come back and hang socially with his age group. Differently, we have a student coming in who's a sixth grade student, which is normally middle school, but he's behind intellectually, academically, and socially, emotionally immature. And so talking to his mom, we agreed, hey, he's better off with the younger children. And again, no stigma, you know, it's just what's right for this kid. Um, and going to that on the younger age, we say eight, but they're mature seven-year-olds. If your seven-year-old can focus adequately, I mean, in theory, it could be a six-year-old, but realistically, I think, you know, seven-year-old is ready to be uh, on, a, on a screen a little bit more, then we could welcome them. And we would want to kind of interview the child and see if they're ready for this. Um, I am giving advice for families of younger children. And Mikkel, you and I haven't talked about this, but I think over time we'll kind of develop a... Uh, a prep program for our program for parents with younger children. So mm -hmm. they, they have the kind of materials they need to create the home environment. Actually, um, we've gone, you and I have gone back a little bit on this vis-a-vis -vis your children. Um, but I think we could formalize that so that we could support families with younger children. And then when they're ready to spend a little bit more time on screens, then they would join our novice program. Mm -hmm. And I want to um, clarify one thing as well. So people understand we don't do grade six, grade seven, grade eight. We're grouping kids based on their needs. So you will have kids in the class who are a little bit older and kids in the class who are a little bit younger, where I think this is amazing is because the older kids get a chance to kind of be leaders, to take care of, to learn responsibility for someone who is younger than them. And the younger kids get to look up to someone, how they should behave, how they can learn, how to interact with one another. So there's always a give and take in these. We're not rigid about these these grades and these exact, you know, you were born in this year, which means you were in this one and that's it. There's no flexibility. We're extraordinarily flexible with this. No, absolutely. Um, and then Kristen asked, average public school is 179 days. Right now, our format is to follow the standard school schedule. So it's September through May with um, a week off for Thanksgiving, two weeks off for winter break, a week off for spring break. And then at this point, US federal holidays. Um, we plan on offering a summer program next year. At some point, we might provide more year-round programming, but we're starting with a standard academic year. It's just simpler, you know, hurting parents is like hurting cats. So um, we try to get... We're trying to anchor things in, in, in programs that people already understand. We're already very different as an alternative, but there are certain things like summer holidays that we're kind of uh, following so people can plan their lives around it. Exactly. So novice program, ages 8 to 11 or so, can, a mature 11-year-old could be in middle school, a less mature 12-year-old could be in the novice program. Um, we provide coverage from 9 a.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Pacific. And that's because a lot of parents need um, that kind of support. What typically happens is that there are only a handful of kids, you know, relatively small groups um, at 9 a.m. Eastern, because of course it's 6 a.m. Pacific and families in that time zone are not ready to go with the, do it yet. And of course, 4 p.m. Pacific is 7 p.m. Eastern. So most East Coast families have dropped off. And so the idea is um, we have sort of uh, early morning time and late afternoon time, which are more small group, high touch. Your child would get more one-on-one -on -one or very small group instruction during this period. And then in the middle of the day, when it's kind of everybody's on board, roughly from you know, 11 a.m. Eastern to maybe 3 p.m. Eastern. That's when we have our group classes, which include math, reading, writing, projects, uh, research, history, research, science research, those sorts of things. 
Um, and it's a very lively group. And one, one thing I like to stress about getting your kids in a program like this early is at that age, children are still very alive and vibrant. Um, sometimes if, you, if your kid is not a good fit for regular school, by the time they get to 12, 13, the light has gone from their eyes. And you know, I've, I've seen some kids really unhappy in secondary school. But the young ones, they're just so alive and vibrant, balls of energy, and they are out there talking and arguing and researching and collaborating and you know, uh, really excited about it. They absolutely love, so again, it's very high engagement. That's not a teacher talking at them. Um, we have, for instance, this math game, the CSMP, where the kids get in teams and on teams, they try to solve complicated team math. Team cheese problems. and team, I can't remember what the other one was, team cheese and team something else. Those yeah. kids were going nuts. Oh my God. When I went to sit on in on the class, they're like, Mikhail, you're on my team. No, no, Mikhail, you're on my team. And they were fighting over me. It was hilarious to watch. Yeah, super energetic and super <laughs> engaged. Um, and, and so the, that's kind of our secret sauce is student to student engagement. Yeah. And um, during academic, during I, I like intellectual rather than academic because academic has kind of sterile, you know, university connotations for me, whereas intellectual is life of mind. But yeah, well, the kids are super engaged in whatever the activities, I mean, even in research, you know, we're all going to learn about beetles. Well, I'm going to study this beetle and I'm going to study that beetle. And then they all get together and present. So the middle of the day, in, in general, secondary school classes are an hour long. In the novice program, they're shorter, maybe 20 to 30 minutes because shorter attention spans. But they go through a lot of cool experiences in that middle of the day piece um, that help them develop high level academic skills while exploring their curiosity on all sorts of other things. And then later in the day, we also do a lot of um, art, music, theater. And so the kids are actually sometimes doing plays or doing dramas uh, virtually online and get a lot of their kind of creative juices going uh, late in the day. Um, sometimes they sing and play songs together. And so there's kind of a nice sort of um, arc. Uh, and in everything, we're about creating a great experience. And we believe that learning can and should be enjoyable. Uh, and that's our art is helping that happen. Absolutely. Should we get to some Q and A, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go for it. So I had a couple of parents who have asked if they can sit in on the classes, if they can see for themselves. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, we try to limit the number of observers, and we also have prospective students. So first of all, um, if your child wants to join, we encourage them to come and observe a full day. Uh, we want alignment, so it's important that it's a good fit. And our priority would be student visitors, but as long as we're not booked to be student visitors, we're happy to have adult visitors. Um, so yeah, absolutely, come and observe. Okay, everybody, you can start putting your questions in the chat box, and I'm gonna try to answer every single one that I can. Okay, Kevin asks, is the program based on classical education principles? Very much so. So I would say um, we're kind of a combination, an interesting combination between classical principles on the one hand and self-directed um, principles on the other. And often people tend to think of those as uh, at tensions with each other. Some classical schools are very kind of top-down orthodox. Um, but one of the things I came away with at St. John's is Again, we're reading classics, of Western civilization, the great books for four years, but we do it um, in a way that reason and evidence are the authorities and not the teacher. So in terms of classical principles, it de depends on if you mean kind of top-down classical or this kind of Socratic version of classical, uh, but certainly respect for classic texts and respect for classic liberal arts education in the quadrivium. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about, say, entrepreneurial and creative projects and students having you know, adult level professional expertise by 18, that's much more like self-directed learning. So I would say we're a hybrid of those two different models, and I think we get the best of both sides. Well, and then from the entrepreneurial side, I'll also chime in. What we're going to be doing is some really fun things. We're actually talking about taking my podcast and doing it live in front of the students. So we would do kind of a webinar format like today, where I would interview the guest, but we would have 50 or 100 kids that were watching the webinar. So we would let them in early so they would see how content is created. They would know what the subject matter was in advance. So they would be able to actually research things, have discussion before the interview takes place. 
Then we do the interview live with them, so they would be actually involved in it, and we would do a giant Q&A at the end where I would let the kids you know, either submit their questions via voice or in the chat box, and I would read it off. And then afterwards, having the kids be able to discuss it and argue and what did they learn in the presentation. So I think that that's going to be very fun from the entrepreneurial side. They'll see how an existing business works, how content creation works from, you know, if this is a New York Times best-selling author that I'm interviewing, if it's someone who's traveled to every country in the world, what did they learn? What was that like? What was the cultures like? How was the food, the cuisine? They'll get their questions answered, which I think is really fascinating. In addition to that, what we're going to be doing from the entrepreneurial side is previous guests who have been on my program, we're going to be inviting them back to give special presentations to the school. So these kids will get to see um, live presentations by successful entrepreneurs, people who have made you know, businesses that generate tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars. I've interviewed people like um, who, who started a water bottle company and sold it. It's a multi-billion dollar company with a B. You know, he's agreed to come on and speak to us again. His name is Travis. He's going to come on and speak to the kids. So there's opportunities there that you will never find in normal, quote unquote, normal education for your kids. Great. Thank you. Um, then going to the next question, uh, accreditation. So the way that works is at the high school level, we offer both an accredited option and an unaccredited option. The accredited option is through the state of Maine. It's, we chose that because it's the most flexible, only 17 and a half credits required, but they would get a standard accredited high school uh, transcript. Because the accreditation requires it, we have to give standard letter grades, A, B, C, D, computer GPA. They also have to meet course distribution requirements, so many years of math, science, and everything. So that is a pretty standard, as it were, conventional option at the high school level. And I would say most parents pick that. One of the reasons we offer the unaccredited option is occasionally we get families um, where they're totally fine with an alternative pathway and maybe their kid is more focused on the entrepreneurial and creative side. Um, I actually had a student who uh, ended up going to Parsons School of Design. He didn't want to take his third year of science to get his third science credit his mom was okay with that we were okay with that and so yeah let him be a world-class creative and he doesn't need to do the standard credits so you can choose whether accredited or not at the high school level we charge more for the accredited at the younger ages our brand promise is grade level skills or higher unless there's a special arrangement and if they have high level academic skills they'll be placed uh, in their grade level you might actually want them to be placed uh, in a more advanced grade and different different districts uh, do kind of different placements, but they they should be uh, above most students locally. So um, Scott, I, I see your message here. And actually, before you chime in, Michael, I want to make a couple of comments about this. So a little bit of history. Before Michael and I decided to do this, I considered myself a homeschool. Actually, to be fair, I still do consider myself a homeschooler with my kids. And Michael, you described it to me as homeschooling by professionals. Now, this really spoke to me a lot and really opened my eyes. You know, we do homeschooling, world schooling, unschooling, basically interest-based learning. And when you said homeschooling by professionals, I really started to think, so what does that mean? How does that look? With my own kids, what we do is we support with additional sports. So uh, Scott's question in a nutshell, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but what about social development? Kids need to have interaction with other kids, face-to-face, -face, uh, playing together, you know, the playground, all of these types of things. My daughter goes to martial arts. She goes four days a week. She goes swimming five days a week. We take her to the park almost every day. She runs around and has drama in the playground like any other normal kid. But during the day, we run a homeschooling program. Now, it is not a video program where I sit her down and she has to watch these videos. You know, we do a lot of interaction based on her exact needs. Now, she's five years old. The school that Michael and I are creating is the first program that I have ever seen in my entire life that I actually feel confident about sending my own child to. Now, that should say a lot. Like, we literally went out there and saw what existed in the world 
and what was lacking. And we took the best from different disciplines. So Michael's background has a lot in Montessori, as well as Socratic, which Michael is very well known for. But we borrowed a lot of ideas from the homeschooling and world schooling and unschooling movement. So we really support the kids in all of these types of things. Um, Michael, I'll let you chime in because I'm sure you have some thoughts about this as well. But that, from my perspective, that's how it is. Sure. No, I would agree with all of that. A couple of additional things. In the U.S., we were starting to get concentrations of families in certain cities. At this point, New York, um, San Francisco, Austin, South Florida. And those families are kind of getting together socially as well. Panama is also getting to be a place. So we're getting to the point where we have cohorts in Panama that can get together in person. Um, in addition to that, one of the first things the kids in secondary did, of course, is they created a Discord channel. So we do have a Slack for students, um, but that's kind of teacher student. So the students um, take all their private stuff over to Discord and who knows what they're talking about, but they definitely have a community and uh, you'll, you'll hear them talking about that. We're also planning a trip to Greece this June. And at this point, we're planning at least one overseas trip together every year. You know, it'd be an additional fee. Um, and over time, I expect we'll go from once a year to maybe a couple times a year. And then families can actually meet in person and um, see each other when possible. That's amazing. Um, yeah, no, it's exciting. Um, and then Kristen asked, when you encounter a request for a course subject not offered, does current tuition include this? So short answer is yes. Um, we don't have a hard dollar figure, but say up to a few hundred dollars, we would go ahead and pay for it. And the fact is most of these courses are either free or 80 bucks for this course or 120 for that course. So, you know, last year we did have one student who wanted to take a $7,000 film course from NYU. And of course, the families <laughs> had to pay extra for that. Turned out to be a terrible course, by the way, total waste oh, of no. money. But to hear that. yeah, but um, yeah, up to kind of a reasonable amount, we would include that. Um, and then Kevin, how this compares to homeschooling, unschooling, great question. I find a lot of homeschoolers gradually become more focused on unschooling. Something that um, I, I like unschooling, but I focus, I think it works best when you are focused on developing high level skills and also positive habits and attitudes. I think the families for whom it works really well are kind of invisibly transmitting, you know, the, the reading, writing, the speaking. I call it Socratic, but they're talking to their kids about all, all ideas all the time. Also, you know, let's get stuff done. Um, and I've seen unschoolers who don't get stuff done. So I would say this is sort of uh, using the resources of the world, as Mikkel said, yeah, homeschooling by professionals. Uh, one thing that we have a lot of experience doing is keeping the eye, our eyes on the, on the end goal. And actually just a relevant note there. So a couple of things. One is it's easier if you're not the parent. I talked to so many homeschooling moms in particular where, um, you know, at some point, age 10, 11, 12, their kid is not very, you know, is resistant, rebelling and so forth. Um, we have a different relationship with the kids and often they're more helpful, right, with us than they would be with mom. Um, the other thing is, just to talk about creatives for a minute, a lot of our creatives uh, love their art, music, drawing, whatever it is, and they are not too focused on what are they gonna do after high school. And so we're very deliberately mentoring them to, to make money, frankly. Uh, I often tell the creatives coming in, you can be a poor, starving artist. If that's your life goal, voila, you can do that. <laughs> um, but most of them most of them want goodies, you know? They, they, they want a great iPhone and at some point a car and a house and so forth. We help them do budgeting processes to see what it looks like, travel. Um, and so we help them focus on life after high school. So I would say, uh, kind of an advantage we have is we're non-parents who can also say, look, what kind of life do you want to lead? Uh, I talked about the creatives. I'll pick on uh, boys addicted to video games. A lot of teenage boys are kind of addicted to video games, sometimes severely, sometimes mildly. And the conversation we have with them is, look, do you want to be living in your mom's basement when you're 30? No. 25? No. 18? No. Okay. When are you going to, when are you going to get it together and really focus on, uh, creating a life for yourself. So ultimately we want children to own their own education. And part of that is, yeah, what am I gonna do with myself? Um, what kind of life do I wanna lead? And then they're in an environment with other students who are, I would say, way more purpose-driven than is the norm in most schools. Uh, and as a consequence, they're much better at creating a life for themselves. 
Yeah, and I will also add to that on the video game note, if your child is obsessed with video games, we're going to be able to mentor them and help them to turn that into an actual career. So, okay, you love video games, wonderful. Now, what does that look like for you to be able to provide for yourself? Now, we are offering programming. That's a, the, the basic programming language. In the future, we're going to be offering blockchain technology and these types of things with the animation from the art side. How does this look? You know, we're going to be able to help these kids. So if that is the path for them, they're not just a user of the video game, but they can become a creator of it, of the of the content of these types of programs. So we can kind of reframe things a little bit for the kids to help them understand. Another point on uh, mentorship, I'm actually a mentor myself. I've just started. We have I have a. Um, a young man named Tristan, who I will be mentoring. Um, I think, Michael, you also do some mentoring. So there's lots of different opportunities to base what your child's strengths are with the mentor. We're really flexible about these types of things. So, you know, if your kid really wants to be an entrepreneur, you know, you might work with me or with Michael or one of our other entrepreneurs. If they really want to be an engineer, well, then maybe their, uh, their mentor might be already worked in this field. Yeah, that's an important point. Thank you, Mikhail. So to put some nuance on that, initially our guides mentor the students, and mm -hmm. typically that's in middle school. At high school, some of them do develop an, a passion and interest and expertise that goes beyond the domain knowledge of a guide. So to give a different example, I have a student who was actually uh, the regional badminton champion of the Caribbean at one point, and then due to COVID, they stopped the badminton tournaments and he got into CrossFit. Now his goal is to create a CrossFit gym. He's super serious competitive about it. And so I happen to know somebody in my network who had created two different CrossFit gyms, who's also a geek about peak performance and nutrition and all of that. So his mentor is somebody who's actually built a CrossFit gym successfully a couple of times. Um, this kid who uh, wasted his money at NYU, uh, he was interested in becoming a playwright. And so I have somebody in my network who actually has uh, had plays produced he's written um, off Broadway I mean not off Broadway in Chicago in the small theater scene in Chicago and so I had somebody whose plays have been produced professionally a mentor a uh, young man who was into writing plays so once your child gets sort of beyond our internal expertise we find a mentor who can take them to the next level with respect to uh, domain expertise yeah, real people who have done real things in their life. There is so much to be said for that. Even earlier when we were talking, Michael, about some of our guides, you know, notice, okay, our art teacher is 19 years old, has created his own art and has been into this for years and years and years. Did you notice that we did not say he went to college to become a teacher for seven years to learn how to become a teacher? No, we're finding people who are already experts in their field who have these types of relationships or can have relationships with the kids and interact with them on their level. This is super powerful stuff here and not something that is done in traditional education or I should say state run education. Okay, guys, get the questions in the chat box. We want to answer as many questions as we can for you guys. We have slated another 25 minutes for today. Um, you know, and I would like to use the absolute most of that, but it's up to you. So questions in the chat box. We're here to help. Okay. While Elizabeth is typing, I want to say something else about the entrepreneurship front. Um, I'm very well connected to the um, world of teen entrepreneurs, and many of you probably heard of the Teal Fellowships, where Peter Teal uh, endowed an award where 20 students under 20 receive $100,000 to drop out of uh, high school or college and develop a entrepreneurial project. Um, and I know the founders of the Teal Fellowship, as well as they later went on to the 1517 fund, which is a VC fund focused entirely on investing in teen and early 20 something entrepreneurs. And um, as a consequence, if your child really is kind of world class on this, you know, we can help uh, them apply for a Teal Fellowship. And, you know, if they want to get funding, um, we can help them prep a pitch for the 1517 fund. Um, yeah, maybe. In terms of Elizabeth's question, set up a child and parent observation. Um, Alex, can you have them e email? So I have put in the chat box, it's expatschool.io forward slash schedule a call. That's going to bring you to a calendar page. From there, you can select a date and a time, 
And that will actually go to Michael's calendar. And, and if I'm available, I'll jump on the call as well. And we will discuss what is going on with your kid, how we can help. And we want to see that this is right for both sides. This is not just one direction, you know, and we'll be very honest. I think if we can't help, if this is not a good fit, we'll be very honest with you. We're very particular about the kids that we take. We want to help as many people as possible, but, um, you know, we're not going to accept people who are not a good fit or the kids uh, are not a good fit for our program. So I do encourage you to schedule a call so we can discover all this stuff and work through it together. Can you guys see the link in there? Can you guys give me a yes if you can see that? expatschool.io forward slash schedule a call. I'm gonna also see if I can put up a button for it. I can see it. Um, Daniel's asking about yearly tuition. So the kind of base level tuition is there we go. Did that go through? Did my button go through? I love this new technology. It says click yeah. here. It came through to me. <laughs> um, the yearly tuition, the base level tuition is 9000 a year for novice and middle school, 10000 a year for high school unaccredited, 14000 a year for accredited high school. And you get a 10% discount if you pay up front. So that comes to you know 8100 in uh, novice and middle school. And then there are slightly higher fees if you do a monthly payment program. And of course, everything is prorated from the day you start. And so those are annual tuitions. And also we do not lock you in. So if you, for whatever reason, decide to leave, um, you get a refund if you'd paid up front and you don't have to keep paying. Um, again, we want people who are a good fit. Um, you know, if, if somebody has a very different understanding of what education would be, should be then you know not good i would say a lot of our parents are entrepreneurs or creative professionals um you know a lot of people who are pursuing their own independent lives in some sense and they know that the world is about those who create value and more than those who jump through hoops i would say there are two very men different mental models about education one is you jump through hoops because that's what you're supposed to do another is the world is an amazing, rich place. If I'm good at creating value, I'll have amazing opportunities. How do I learn how to create value? And Absolutely. And one other note on pricing, just to put things in perspective. When I lived in the Middle East, the pricing would be around twenty to thirty to even thirty-five thousand dollars per kid to attend a private international school. So our prices are, I would think, very reasonable. I think that in the next couple of years, our prices will go up. What we want to do is attract the brightest kids and the most interesting and creative kids. So we're keeping things quite affordable right now. But as you guys become expats and move overseas, understand that you will have to pay for private education. Um, it's not often offered by, uh, by the country, your host country that you're in or even if it is offered, it's probably not at a level that you would want for your children. I can speak from um, being an expat from 21 years and living in Panama, I have many, many expat families who are friends of mine and every single one of the kids goes to an international school and the prices in Panama will be around the 12 to $15,000 mark. So I think that our prices are very competitive, especially when you take into a how um, flexible we are with customizing things based on your kids' needs. No, thank you. Kevin asks, what are the plans for the future? Yeah, definitely expanding communities worldwide. Um, we're all about growth and offering this to as many families as possible. Um, actually, one of the things I love about virtual, I resisted going virtual for many years because I love face-to-face in-person experiences. But one of the great things about going virtually is we are getting so many more aligned families. You know, we're getting a lot of people sometimes from rural areas or, you know, Mikhail mentioned, um, you know, expat schools. Not all of those are very focused on student agency and student ownership of their education. Um, so there are people from around the world who are excited about what we're doing, and it's, it really is a wonderful community. Um, because we're already across all four time zones in the U.S., um, I would say anybody in the Western Hemisphere should find us pretty easy to work with. Um, and again, we have people in Europe, Africa, and Middle East who are mm -hmm. managing to uh, join our program. Some of those are just doing half days because the second half of our day is too late for those time zones. Um, the girl who stays up till two in Pakistan is really kind of 
crazy. Enthusiasm. She's lovely, by the way. She's so interactive and she's so energetic and excited to be there. Yeah, I, I actually, just to brag about her, um, she was the youngest student. She's 14 now. She was the youngest person accepted to the National uh, Entrepreneurial Incubator in Pakistan, also the youngest stand-up comedy comedian in Pakistan. Um, she just gave a she told talk. she told me in the class that she did comedy as well. That's amazing. She's, and then didn't, a, don't we have a family just starting in Oman, an American family who's moved to Oman? We do, and that's through your network, Mikel. And and their their situation is, I would say, the father is very creative and entrepreneurial, and he sees that the Omani schools are not giving his daughters what he thinks they need for life mm -hmm, in the 20th, mm -hmm. 20th first century. So they're enrolled for half days because Oman time zones are a little bit late, but uh, you know, he's- yeah, I think that as things progress, we will offer a European time as well as an Asian time. You know, we will hopefully be doing in different languages. So the core of the program offered in Spanish, not just Spanish as an alternative um, uh, program for learning Spanish, but actually the core program spot. Um, in Spanish. So there's many things from the, the, the growth of this school and the future of this school. Yep. And Daniel, yes, the kids can be enrolled anytime. Again, we're maximal flexibility. Um, you know, typically there are a couple of calls and, um, you know, an observation. We definitely want your child to observe classes. Um, and then after that, if it looks like a good fit, they can enroll basically the next day. Um, and Bryce, yes, high school students can do it part time. Again, we are most schools are bureaucracies. Even most private schools are bureaucracies. We are uh, totally customer focused and flexible. So mm -hmm. um, we're entrepreneurs ourselves, and we're here to solve problems. That's the core of what we do. So yeah, yeah. And Scott, thank you for the recommendation on the Europe Russia sphere. We we do have some people there. Um, so Bryce, yeah, we would we would we should probably talk about your particular child and what they need. So, you know, we would, in a call, um, we would talk about what their goals are, what credits they'd have. You know, the big thing is knowing what your goals are. So um, based on post high school goals, then we kind of work backward in terms of what makes sense in terms of uh, credit and time and interest and all of that. So that sort of thing is pretty personalized. I'm going to put the link there again in the chat in case someone missed it. So you guys, you'll be able to schedule a call. Make a, maybe you can kind of walk everyone through what will the call entail? What kind of things would you discuss on a call with a parent? How would that look? Yeah. So, you know, again, we want to know about your child, um, what, what their passions are, what their interests, uh, what's the relationship to school, what's work, what hasn't, what their academic skills are like. Um, when we talk to the child and we like to do that, what do you love? Often children are surprised because schools are never interested in them. Uh, maybe I'm being a bit exaggerating a little bit, but it's us. when I, I've talked to hundreds of kids, most of them are surprised that the first thing we ask them is what do they love? What do they care about? What are they passionate about? Um, and so it's really a matter of getting to know you, know, you and your children and uh, are we a good fit uh, in terms of pedagogical goals? And can we meet your needs? Can we can we really be something that works with you? And I would say by the time we get to a call with a vast majority of parents, it does work because um, you know we're self-selecting. You guys showed up here. Uh, people who don't like a rhetoric usually don't show up. Uh, but if it looks you like what you're here, then usually kids love it. And and just the engagement when they observe. Uh, most students are so delighted that they're in a community where they get to think, talk, and argue with their peers, and the adults really respect their opinions um, and ask them, you know, what do you think and why, and so forth. Um, and it's remarkably warm. I mean, a virtual community, it sounds strange, but many of our students find that they are more connected virtually uh, in our community than they were in their brick and mortar school before they started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, you guys keep putting in the questions because I love all of these questions. These are fantastic. I've been reading through them. We're going to try to get to every single one. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that I think you guys should know the answers to. And Michael, maybe you can answer. Now, you kind of touched on this before, the interaction between the kids. Do you see any bullying? Do you see any fights? Do you see... Um, you know, not obviously physical violence because it's a virtual school, but emotional violence or any of these types of things in our program. 
No, I mean, you know, occasionally some kids somewhere might be a little bit mean. <laughs> you know, I can't, kids are kids, but on the whole, it's super warm environment. Just a couple of specific things. Um, one is, I think a lot of the bullying and meanness comes from kids being bored and disrespected, and then they take it out on other kids. So if you start with a program where the kids are respected and given a voice, and you're attracting families for whom this is attractive, um, we start with a pretty good cultural substrate from the get-go. Beyond that, we do things like, um, we actually do appreciations, even in the high school. So, you know, a certain number of elementary schools have appreciations, some adult workplaces do. Very few secondary schools uh, are very appreciative places. But yeah, um, what do we appreciate? Student to student, peer to adult to student, student, adult, student to adult, whatever. We want to create an environment where people are positive and respectful. And part of this is the whole personal growth thing, that they're reflective. The environment we have is um, one in which kids are thinking and enjoying thinking together. Um, and yeah, if, if somebody is mean, sometimes we talk about it, but it's it's so rare. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's really a positive. What about from the safety aspect, Michael? What kind of things do we have in place as a school that if something does happen, um, that the kids are protected? Yeah, well, one of the things we, there are kind of two different issues. One is, you know, in your, in your home and with older children, they are alone. And so obviously we need, um, you know, emergency contact information for those sorts of situations. And then we also video record every and store every class. And so one of the things that does is, you know, if a child does say something inappropriate, you know, we live in a world where, say, sexual harassment issues are very much a real thing and there's a lot of awareness for good reason. Um, you know, everything is recorded. And so it's not he said, she said. We can go back into it and look at exactly what happened. Um, and so the idea is everybody knows that this is, in, a, in essence, public and recorded and transparent. And we find that um, kids just don't do uh, inappropriate things. You know, as we grow sooner or later, that will happen. But um, one of the reasons actually we didn't use GatherTown, so this gets into technology choices. GatherTown is kind of a cool piece of technology, but it has terrible security and does not record all the conversations. And so one of the first things we look at when we look at new software platforms is, can we record and monitor everything? Uh -huh. um, and that even gets to you know, Slack. And you know, so we're super focused on that because you know, and, and actually one of my mild concerns is I joke, kids go off to Discord and do what they do. We don't have control about what they're doing over at Discord. Um, you know, it's a trade-off. I think they do need the privacy away from adults, but if they get into something over there, we can't control that. All we mm -hmm. can do is control our environment, but we're very rigorous about controlling our environment. Well, and just to clarify, when you say that the information is public, we don't mean it is public for anybody to go out there. The, the classes are not published where right. anybody can come in, everything is password protected, it's all encrypted, all the data is 100% secure, but it is stored in a secure place. So if there is a complaint, and we're talking about a serious complaint here, we can actually go back and look at the records. None of this stuff goes on social media, none of it goes on YouTube or anything like that. Today's presentation, you know, uh, with the parents, everything, yes, this is going to go out, but the classrooms themselves, none of it goes on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, anything like this. Yes, thank you. Um, Elizabeth is asking about when kids need extra help, and I would say, you know, up to a point, we give everything so personalized that most of the time, almost everything is would qualify as extra help by normal school standards. Every once in a while, we get a child with, you know, who needs fairly substantial extra help. And so occasionally, I would say maybe one out of 100, it goes beyond the kind of customized, personalized approach we do. But we do have students who are getting a significant extra help, say, in math right now, and we're staffed for that. Uh, but I just, you know, can't promise everything because occasionally we have a child who's who's kind of way outside. And typically, if that's the case, um, in the intake conversations, uh, say a child maybe you know had a difficulty in the past and we discuss it and part of what we do in evaluating your child coming in is is with this within the bounds of the kind of extra help we can do um, or not and if not typically the parent will already have realized that you know this child needs a lot a lot uh, so yeah rarely it's beyond what we can offer
Mm -hmm. um, Christian offer asks about state funding in US. Where that is, is right now we are not eligible, but we are working on it. And there's been a huge boom in um, state funding for private schools in the last year. I believe 18 states now have those programs. And we will probably be eligible starting next fall in some states and we'll add new states every year. So um, that is in process and definitely a big target. Um, Dave would like to know, what is the minimum age for your program? And we say eight, but a mature seven-year-old um, and a, you know, a really a capable six-year-old part-time might be possible, but you know, can, they, can they sit and focus? Mm -hmm. And the top end of that, just, just for everybody else on the call, it does go to 19 years old. So the program, I think uh, we have some of the kids who are basically doing extra education because they like the program and the curriculum so much that they may have finished traditional school, but maybe university is not the right answer for them. Yeah, very much. And on that point, I would say that insofar as many students experience a school is jumping through hoops, this is the first opportunity they've had to have high touch people who care about them in their personal direction, they're mm -hmm. mentoring them and so forth. So yeah, we do have some students who could have gone on to college, but prefer to work with us because it's such a personal experience. And Daniel uh, is asking about special activities. At this point, um, the one kind of quasi special activity that we do have from the school is we have a showcase in December and again in May where the students show each other their projects. And so it's that kind of community event. Um, at this point, you know, we have so many different cultures and religions. We're not kind of trying to solve that at the secondary level. They do do a little bit of celebrating of different cultural traditions in the elementary program. Um, but mostly we just stick to the showcase at this point. Wonderful. I love these questions, everyone. So many good questions here. If you guys put them in the chat box, Scott is typing. Scott, we're here to help. Put the questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to everybody. If you guys are listening to this later on, you guys are going to be able to go to expatschool.io. You can either go to expatschool.io and view the website and read more about the curriculum, about the administration, uh, administrative um, process, about the onboarding, about the different types of programs, about the ages, you can do all of that. And I encourage you guys to go to expatschool.io forward slash schedule a call. It's actually schedule dash a dash call. Or if you just go to the website in the top right hand corner, you're going to see that button there. It's a big orange button. Okay, Scott would like, Scott says, thank you guys. I need to jump off. Mikkel, do a meetup in Panama. We're here because we're listening to you. Thank you so much, Scott. We are actually going to do a big Christmas party. I haven't announced it yet, but I'll, I'll tell you guys first here. We're going to do a Christmas party on December 18th in Panama, Panama City. We're looking at locations right now. So you guys can mark that on your calendar. We have tons of people in Panama. I'm expecting we'll probably get... 50 people here. We did a meetup here in Colombia last week. I think we had 22 or 24 people, and that was just with a quick uh, email that I was in town. So lots of fun things there. Kristen says, to clarify, the school right now is technically Socratic experience, but will eventually break off into the expat international school. That's one way of thinking about it. What we have right now is kids from both programs that are doing one school. So we have kids from around the world in many different expat communities who are going to one class. As the schools grow, we will be separating them, but the uh, expat kids and the uh, domestic kids are in the same place at the moment, if that makes sense. But the school is up and running. Uh, classes are being done right now, are taking place. We have kids who are doing their projects and it is a up and running business. Kristen says, thank you, my pleasure. Nick is typing. So yeah, so there's just so much flexibility with this program. I just think it's so exciting. You know, I was talking to someone, I think, oh, a couple of weeks ago now. Now I've done a lot in my life. I've traveled a lot, I've built businesses, I'm independently wealthy. I think that's no secret at this point. Um, I've done a lot in my life. I honestly can say that Expand International School is probably the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Like I am more excited about this than anything else. Like 
me and my wife are talking about this every day. I'm sharing this with my friends, with my family. Like I'm just so pumped up to be able to offer this. I had an absolutely horrendous experience with public education and I got bullied and I got in fights. I was literally today speaking to a plastic surgeon about getting my nose fixed because I got in fights when I was a kid and had my nose broken. And now at almost 40 years old, I still have problems breathing. I don't want kids to have to go through this experience. You know, what happened to me should not happen. I'm not a victim by any means. I mean, I hate victim mentality, but I want to be able to go out there and help kids. So I'm so passionate about this, about the program that Michael and I are creating. And Michael and I take weekly calls and we discuss ideas and we brainstorm. And there's so many awesome things that we have in the works here. Daniel asks, is there something like a report card? Michael, is there a report card? Yeah, so two, two answers, one the accredited and one the unaccredited. Um, at the accredited high school level, it does include, again, we're required to have grades, so A, B, C, D, GPA, and so forth, plus narratives. Um, at the lower levels and for the unaccredited, it is strictly narratives, but we do focus on um, kind of grade level progress, and so we give you a sense for where your child is. Uh, but every quarter they get, uh, yeah, a report card. We call them quarterly reports. Um, and at the high school level, one thing I didn't mention, and this is U.S. centric, but a lot of expats actually want to send their child to U.S. universities. We administer a free Khan Academy SAT practice exam three times a year in September, January, and May so that college bound students get abundant practice um, on the SAT and we can track their growth and help them set goals in terms of SAT progress. And so in addition to um, kind of whatever narrative report, you actually get a chart of uh, test growth if that's a goal. Kristen says, this is the most exciting school option we've found. And I have looked extensively for the best fit for my son. Thank you for your time this evening. Kristen, thank you. I'm really glad that you got some value from this, from this presentation. And we would really welcome you to take a call and to discuss your son's future. You know, we'd be happy to try to help. Daniel is typing while Daniel is typing. If there is any other questions, please put them in the chat. We're, we're coming up on our time tonight. So I wanna be respectful of everybody here. And um, okay, here we are. Daniel asks, is there something, okay. Uh, will my daughter be able to get accepted into a Canadian university? Excellent question. Michael, you, I'll let you handle the university uh, topic because I think it is an important one. Yeah, so in Canadian universities, you know, obviously we would want to target, but the accredited high school diploma, that's easy. Um, so they would certainly, you know, be uh, eligible on that one. Uh, obviously, some universities are more competitive than others. And so if you're looking at a selective university, then we would make sure that we track the development of high level academic skills uh, in order to get in. Um, one of the things I didn't mention <coughs> is that universities also like um, the amazing real world projects. So in addition to whatever grades, test scores, um, essay samples for getting in, uh, they, and they would, you know, the accredited program, they get a traditional transcript showing all their grades and credits. Um, it's also impressive to, uh, talk about, oh, I created a three day music festival, or I, you know, created videos for a professional corporation. Those sorts of things are also a bonus in terms of um, college admissions. Well, I think it really makes the, the child stand out. Imagine you're sitting there, you know, looking at admissions all day and every single one looks exactly the same. And then your child comes up and they've done this extraordinary thing throughout their, their junior high and high school uh, time. I think that those types of things are going to be looked on very positively, actually. So don't think of this school as a negative. Actually think of this as a massive positive for the kids. Well, we are at the end of our 90 minutes, everyone. We are at the end of our questions. So one more time, if you guys want to find out more information, you guys can go to expatschool.io. Up in the top right-hand corner, you will see a big button. It says schedule a call. 
click on that it will take you to a calendar page you can select the date you can select the time and we will speak to you guys then kevin says thank you for the presentation daniel says thanks i saw before lots of thanks lots of people Kristen says thank you nick says sounds awesome we'll be in touch for sure happy to help nick thank you so much dave says thanks Bryce says, thank you both. Uh, Andred says, thank you. You guys are super. Daniel says, thanks, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. Amazing. Wonderful night. Thank you very much, Michael, for your time. I really appreciate it. And we will talk to everyone soon. Have a great night. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.